let me say a word in defense of reason in dialogue with faith. Because faith is that proof. Faith unites us to that substance. But reason, in order to realize its full potential, needs the horizons revealed by and truths contained in the faith. And not just any faith, but the Catholic faith. One time, I went into a bookstore, and it was in Livonia. In fact, Father Brad LePage, who is a TOR here, used to buy books in that bookstore, and I used to work there, and I wonder if we ever met. But I remember going there one time after becoming a Catholic. I was already in the Catholic Church, and I went there to buy an anti-Catholic book. That's because I still have the best anti-Catholic library of anybody. It's a good way to keep up on what's going on, to go see what's really being said. So I went to the bookstore that day, and I said, I want this book. I don't remember the name of it. And they brought out the book, and I said, thank you very much. And it was very much rabidly anti-Catholic. He says, oh, and by the way, if you like this book, I have these two also for you. And he pulled two more books off the, out from under the counter. And I said, oh, no, thank you. I already have those. He said, what did you think about them? I said, they're trash. Now, the bookstore was full of people shopping. And he said, what do you mean they're trash? I said, it's exactly what it is. They're trash. I said, they misrepresent what the Catholic Church actually teaches, and they twist the scripture like a rubber nose to get it to fit your tradition. Well, he says, who are you? I said, I'm a, ba I'm a Catholic convert. I used to be a Baptist. Now I'm a Catholic. Well, all the people in the store started to come up by the counter because they heard something was interesting going on. And this guy's voice was getting loud. He's getting animated. Who are you? I'm a Catholic convert, I said. He said, why would you leave real Christianity to be, follow the traditions of men? I said, follow the, oh, I know what you mean. I said, but the problem is, is I follow the scriptures. You are the one that follows the tradition of men. And if you live in a glass house, you shouldn't throw stones. What do you mean I follow the traditions of men, he said. Well, let me ask you a question. Do you believe that you're saved by faith alone? Of course, the Bible teaches we're saved by faith alone. We've known that ever since Martin Luther. We're saved by faith alone. That's the biblical true teaching. I said, really, show me where it says that in the Bible, since you have also believed in sola scriptura, I'm assuming. Yes, I do. Well, show me in the Bible alone where it says faith alone. He quickly flips to Romans 3, chapter 20, uh, 23. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And he reads on and he says, And we are saved by faith and not by works of the law. And he closed his Bible. I said, you, it says we're saved by faith, but I didn't hear the word alone. You said alone, faith alone. Catholics believe we're saved by faith, just not faith alone. And you said the Bible taught it. I want to see it. He starts flipping back and forth to more places. I recommended a few verses. He tried them. It didn't work. <laughs> and everybody is really angry because they're all on his side. They want me to lose this argument. So then he's all flustered. I said, wait a minute. I'm sorry. I forgot. There is a place in the Bible where faith and alone, those two words are together. I'm sorry. I forgot about that one. I said, um... My apologies. Would you please open to James 2.24 and read that? He opens it up and it says, So you see, brothers, we are saved by works and not by faith alone. <laughs> he said, I didn't know that verse was in the Bible. I said, I didn't either when I used to work here. <laughs> faith alone... What does Paul mean by the moment? Just to digress. The problem with Protestants using these verses in Romans and Galatians is they're twisting them out of their context, both biblically and historically. When you read a book like Romans, you have to say, what was the current situation? What was Paul addressing? What did the people believe? What was Paul trying to straighten them out about? The Baptist who comes to your door does not have a clue what Paul's original argument was, unless they've gone to university, and then they should know better. But the average one, 
thinks that it means that Catholics get saved by doing good deeds like picketing abortion clinics and helping the poor and, and uh, taking care of the lonely. And Baptists get saved by faith in Christ. The problem is, is that faith alone is never taught there anywhere. And what does it mean? What does Paul mean when he says we're saved not by works but by faith? Works of the law had a specific technical definition. The Protestant thinks it means just good works and faith. But in Paul's day, if you were a Jew, you had to do the works of the law. And the works of the law was what made you recognizable as a Jew. In other words, as a Jew, you had to be circumcised, you had to obey the Sabbath, you had all of the different ceremonial laws that you had to follow, and these were things God gave them to separate them from the nations. They were called the works of the law. They had to be circumcised. That's how you knew that they were not a Gentile, but a Jew. I've always wondered how they knew they were circumcised, though. I never have figured that out. So a guy walks in. How do you know that he's circumcised or not circumcised? I, they have a special little room that they have to go in or something and show that. I don't know, the police, I don't. But you had to, these were called the works of the law. And what Paul is saying is, you don't get saved by doing all of these Jewish things. You don't get saved by following all the rules. There are, the Jews say that there are 613 laws in Moses. We know of 10 commandments. The Jews know 613 that Moses commanded. And you have to obey these laws. And you have to circumcise and do all of these things. And that's how you're separated. And those are the works of the law. And in Acts 15, Paul had been up preaching to the Gentiles. And some of them were believing in Jesus. And the Jewish Christians from Jerusalem went to Antioch and said, You cannot become Christians. Christ, meaning those who follow the Messiah. He said, you have to first become Jews. The Messiah is Jewish. He's ours. He's a Jewish Messiah. You want the Jewish Messiah? Become a Jew and you can have him. But you can't have him uncircumcised. And Peter stood up and said, no. I was just the other day in Caesarea Maritime by the sea, and the Holy Spirit fell on Cornelius, and he was baptized. He received the Holy Spirit without being circumcised. And the church declared a decree. And in the Greek, the word decree here is actually dogma. And he said, from now on, the Gentiles do not have to be circumcised and obey all the laws of Moses. They can be saved by faith in Christ, by believing how is your father Abraham saved? That's why Abraham keeps coming up in Galatians and Romans. How was your father Abraham saved? He was saved by faith, not by works of the law. They didn't even have the Mosaic law in the time of Abraham. He was way before that. So how did Abraham get saved? By faith. Now this leads me to another interesting story. A guy came to my house after I'd converted to the faith. He was a Baptist. He didn't want to admit it. I figured it out later. He came there as an objective inquisitor to ask me why would I leave a Baptist church to become a Catholic? And he wanted to ask me this. Oh, he was so sincere and so honest. I said, come on over. We'll make dinner for you and we'll talk. So I did. And I started talking to him and he started asking me all these questions. He said, you know, you probably learned this when you were a boy, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I said, of course, I memorized that for 50 cents when I was seven years old. Of course, I know that verse. He says, well, don't you see there that it says you're saved at one point in time. When you believe, you are saved. He said, this corresponds to Abraham. And he says in Genesis chapter 15, 6, it says, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. In other words, when Abraham believed God at one point in space and time, God made him righteous at that moment. Abraham was saved for all time. And I said, I don't think so. First of all, in John chapter 3, verse 16, where it says that he is saved, is in the present tense when a Greek person would read it, they would read it as, he who is believing. He who is believing will be having eternal life. Not a once in time, but it's a habitual action. We are believing. 
But I asked this man, when was Abraham saved? He said, when he believed God. Once and for all, Abraham was saved. I said, we have a problem here. If Abraham is the example of the father of faith, we have a problem. So let's go back and do another Bible study. I love taking these good Protestants on Bible studies. I liked it when Bishop, uh, Archbishop um, said today at the Mass how he invited the Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons in and read the Bible with them. I thought that was brilliant. I thought that was brilliant. So I said to him, let's take a look at, at Genesis chapter 12. It says that Abraham believed God and followed him. God says, go where I'll lead you. And it said Abraham did this. He went and followed God. And the book of Hebrews said it was by faith that he did this. By faith, Abraham left his homeland and went where God called him. Now, why is Abraham the father of faith and not us? Because when God says, go pick up everything you own and go to a land I will show you, I would have said, well, what about my mortgage? Will I have health insurance? And is there going to be security for my wife? When I, and where is this, by the way? I want to put the coordinates in my GPS. I want to know. And God says, no, I'm not telling you any of this. Just go to the place where I tell you. And Abraham went 1,600 miles on camels, not in a bus. And he went not even knowing when God was going to say, stop, this is it. He just kept moving. But it was by faith. So I asked my friend Jerry, was this some other kind of faith, saving faith, or some other kind of faith that Abraham had? Well, I don't know. Then it says when Abraham came to the land, it says he built an all. And by the way, he was 75 years old when he did this. He comes to the land, and it says that Abraham built an altar to the Lord in the Samaria, in Canaan, which is today Israel. In Samaria, he built an altar to the Lord, and he called upon the name of the Lord. I said to Jerry, do you know... In, Revel in Romans, one of the verses we used to use to get Catholics saved, in Romans chapter 10, verses 9, 10, it says, anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. It just said Abraham built an altar and called upon the name of the Lord, so maybe he got saved here instead. Well, no, Jerry didn't quite know. Genesis 15, 6 says, Abraham believed God, and he said, I'll count it to you as righteousness. Ah, maybe this is it. Then there's 13 years of silence. Genesis chapter 17 rolls around. And God, oh, and by the way, during this period of time, Abraham had to go down into the land of Egypt for a while because there was a famine. That's over 250 miles, by the way, to go down to Egypt, and 250 miles back with your flocks and your herds. I would have said to God, you're crazy, I'm going back home. At least in Ur of the Chaldees, I know what's going on. It's a rich city, I had my wealth. But Abraham continues to follow God. Now he's 99 years old, and God appears to him in a vision and said, Abraham, Abraham, I know that you believe me. Now I'm going to give you a sign of the covenant. And Abraham thinks, well, it's about time I get something good from this. God promised me a son, and he promised me the land. When I was 75, I'm now 99. It's 25 years later. I don't own one inch of the land, and I don't even have a son. And my name is Abram, which means father. God says, I'm going to give you a covenant, and I'm going to change your name. I'm going to change your name to Abraham. That's even a crueler name because it means father of nations, and he doesn't even have a son. Hello, who are you? My name's Abraham. Oh, yeah, where's your sons and your nation? I don't have a son. It's a cruel name to give Abraham. And then he says, and the sign of the covenant, Abraham's thinking, finally, I'm going to get something good out of this deal. God hands him a flint knife and says, cut it off. Circumcise yourself. I was talking to a group of teenagers, and a boy in the back was just shocked. He said, the whole thing... And God said, circumcise yourself and all the men who are with you. At that point, I would have said, forget it. I'm on my way home. You're crazy. I must be hearing things when I hear your voice. But Abraham, at 100 years old, took a flint knife and circumcised himself and all the men with him. And then he has a son a year later. And the son is 15 years old. And God says... Take your son, your only son, whom you love, 
By the way, that's the first time the word love is used in the Bible. Do you recognize anything there when I say, take your son, your only son, whom you love? Another father who had an only son whom he loved? Do you think it's by chance that's the first time the Holy Spirit used the word love in the Bible at that point? Take your son, your only son whom you love, take him three days to Mount Moriah, and there I want you to offer him as a living sacrifice. That does it. I'm going home. You have just gone too far. But Abraham doesn't say that. He doesn't even argue. In fact, you want to know what even makes it more poignant than anything is that in the Hebrew text, it is not a command. It is a request in the Hebrew structure of the words. It does not say, I command you to go offer your sons. In the Hebrew, it says, I request that you do this. Abraham could have said no without disobeying God. But his love and trust of God, he said, not only will I do what you command me, I will do also what you desire of me. And he took his son three days walk to Mount Moriah. Where's Mount Moriah? The top of Jerusalem. And 2,000 years later, another father who had an only begotten son took him to the same place, Moriah, and offered him as a sacrifice. And I would love to go through all the typology, but I don't have time. You come on a pilgrimage, we do it all overlooking Jerusalem. But he says, take your son and offer him up a sacrifice, and Abraham did it. He took his son three days' walk. If you had a son, an only son, and you were 100 years old, and you had to walk three days knowing that you're going to kill him and burn him on an altar, what would you be thinking those three days while you were walking? There's never even an indication that Abraham doubted or refused to obey God. And they got there, and he took Isaac up and was ready to slay him. And God says, stop, now I know you fear me. Come on, God. I haven't proved it already. I had to go through this. Now I know that you fear me. Take your son back home. And he took him back home. And that's why it says Abraham is a father of faith. Abraham did not just believe God, but Abraham obeyed God. Revelation and Galatians are full of Paul arguing against the Jews. You do not have to be, but you're not saved by being by doing all the Jewish things, you are saved by faith and obedience to Christ. And in the book of James, he tells us that we're saved by works. It says, when Abraham offered up his son Isaac, he was justified when he did that work. Abraham, Paul says Abraham was justified by faith. James says Abraham was justified when he offered up his son Isaac. That's why he's the father of faith. So when you hear someone say you're saved by faith alone, you say no. What does the word believe mean? People say to me, Steve, your Catholic gospel is so complicated. If I was hit by a car and laying on the side of the road and I only had one minute left to live, how would you explain to me your complicated Catholic gospel in one minute? I said I would be very simple. I would say one sentence, and it's the Catholic gospel in a nutshell. Acts chapter, three, Acts chapter 16, verse 31. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. Didn't even take a minute. I did it in 10 seconds. That is the Catholic gospel in a nutshell. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. But now I find out that this guy on the side of the road is not going to die in one minute. I actually have one hour. So what am I going to do? I'm going to sit down and we're going to discuss what does the word believe mean? When Paul says believe on the Lord Jesus, what does the word believe mean? The word believe, do you know what the opposite of it is? You think that the word believe, the opposite would be to disbelieve. What's the opposite of the word believe? John chapter 3, verse 36. Believe on the Son of God and you will have life. Disobey the Son of God and you will not have life. Scriptural terms, the opposite of the word believe is disobey. So wrapped up in the word believe is the concept, I mean, is a, a, a concept of obedience that you also have to obey. So I think that the word believe is like a hot dog. If you go into a restaurant and you tell the waiter you would like a hot dog, 
And the next thing you know, she or he comes out, and he's got a frozen hot dog, and he drops it on your table. What are you going to say? You idiot, what is this? It's a hot dog. I know it's a hot dog. But what is this? Why isn't it cooked? You didn't say you wanted it cooked. You just said you wanted a hot dog, and I gave you a hot dog, so shut up. I said, wait, we got a communication problem here. I thought you would understand that I wanted a plate and a bun and a hot dog cooked with mustard and relish and a napkin and fries. You didn't ask for all of that stuff. You asked for a hot dog, and I gave you a hot dog. The word believe is like a hot dog. When Paul says you must believe, it is a pregnant word. It's a pregnant word. It's like a zip file. For those of you who know computers, if you want to send a whole bunch of pictures to your family, you can't just send them all over the internet. It's too big. It bounces back. You have to compress them all down, squeeze, and I have no idea how it does it. I just know it works. You put it all down into a zip file, which is small. You send it to them. They have to unzip it, unpack it, and then all the pictures are there. The word believe is a zip file. In that word believe is packed a lot of things. It's like a code word. Everybody in Jesus' time knew what it meant. We don't because we've come to believe that the word believe means something like two plus two is four. I believe that. It's something that you can see and touch and believe. I believe that. But the word believe in the Bible means to obey, to believe to the point of committal and obedience. And so wrapped up in that word believe is obedience, like the hot dog. Now, what does believe mean in Jesus' mind when he says, believe on me, that we are saved by believing on Christ? Well, let me tell you a story. There was a man who one time was going across the Niagara Falls on a tightrope, and they announced it in the news long beforehand so that everyone would come, and they got the guy on the tightrope, and he got up and he went on the microphone, I'm going to go on the tightrope now across the Niagara Falls from the United States to Canada. I just want to have a show of hands here. How many think I can really do it? And everybody raises their hands and says, we believe you can do it. Okay, here I go. He starts across the tightrope. It's windy. He struggles. They're catching their breath over there. Finally, after an hour, he arrives at the other side. Everybody goes, Phew. We all catch our breath. Okay, he says, now I'm going to go back across the tightrope. But this time I'm going across with blindfolds over my eyes so I can't see a thing. How many of you believe I can still do it? Louder than ever. We believe. We believe you can do it. He goes across the tightrope, barely balancing can't see the winds blowing, can't see where his foot's going to go down, finally gets to the other side again. Everybody now is really exhausted. Catch their breath. Whew, he made it. Okay, show's over. Guys, no, no, one more. He says, I, I still want to try one more thing. I'm going to go back across the tightrope again, and this time I'm going to have the blindfolds on my eyes, but I'm going to, in addition, I'm going to go across with a man on my back. How many believe I can do it? We believe you can do it more than ever. Oh, they cheer. We believe. We believe. They chant it. And then the man asked for a volunteer. <laughs> and nobody volunteered. Did they really believe he could do it? This is biblical belief. Biblical faith is the kind where you put your life on the line, where you believe in Jesus Christ, not just in a mental capacity, but where you believe him enough to obey him, where you believe him enough to die for him, to get on his back and let him carry you across eternity, even if it means you have to deny your own life and lose it. In my book, Crossing the Tiber, I wanted to put this point to rest about faith alone. And on page 100, I, found, I listed things that the Bible says we need to be saved by believing. And I list the verses. I'm not going to go through them all. It says even by Peter on the day of Pentecost, we're saved by repentance, which is something that you do. 
Repentance is something you do. And by the way, when they say that you're not saved by works, only by faith or by believing, the last time I looked up the word believe in the dictionary, it was a verb. It's something you do. Believe is a verb. So now we've established I do have to do something. Even though the point I have to believe, I have to do a work. I have to do exert myself. Oh, no, no, no. I don't mean that. I mean it's like a free gift. All you have to do is accept the free gift of God. Yes, but accept is also a verb. What if I don't accept it? What if I don't do anything? Say, I'm just going to do it by faith alone. I'm not going to, I'm not going to do anything. Then you're not going to be saved. So now that we've established with the fundamentalists that there's something you have to do, it's only a matter of degrees. The Bible says that we're saved by believing. We're saved by repentance. We're saved by water baptism. We're saved by the work of the Spirit. Romans chapter 10, 9, and 2 says, If you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord, you will be saved. Oh, so now we have to confess with our mouth to be saved. Paul says twice that salvation comes by coming to a knowledge of the truth. Oh, so now we have to learn the knowledge of the truth and believe it. That's how we're saved. Romans 2 and James 2 both say that we're saved by our works. Matthew, Colossians, we're saved by our perseverance. Grace, blood, righteousness, Christ, a whole list of things that are part of what it means to be saved, things that are components of what salvation is. So when you say that you have to believe, it's a pregnant word. All of these things are included in the word believe. I'm going to believe you, Lord. I believe in you. Now, what do you want me to do? I want you to repent. I want you to be baptized. I want you to do good works for me. I want you to have the Spirit. I want you to confess with your mouth. And all of these things will bring you to the gates of heaven. Not faith alone, which is why the faith alone was never used in the Bible.